it's Molly, the young adult librarian here at the Boonville Library. I have another first chapter Friday to share with you today. It's another young adult book, and this is on our new shelf. Um, the book was published in 2011, but it's new to us because we just got the book a couple months ago. So I pulled this off of the new shelf, and this is Shelter by Harlan Coben. And <clears throat> it has um, four stars on goodreads.com. I always go to Goodreads for reviews, um, tend to be pretty reliable. So again, on Goodreads, it's four stars. Um, the genres that this book is listed under are mystery, obviously young adult, thriller, crime, suspense, and adventure. And I would say that this book, young adult is usually 12 to 18 age range. I would give this book maybe about a 15 to 18 age range, um, just based on what I've seen about the book online. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything super graphic in the book. Um, so, um, um, and some of the quotes from the Goodreads reviews are as follows from three different readers that left reviews. Someone said, I was so pleased to see the general lightly played humor throughout the novel. So already kind of can tell from that review that there is probably some humor in here. So it might be a little bit more lighthearted than you would expect from a typical thriller or suspense novel. Someone else said it's another highly addictive read from Harlan Coben. So this uh, uh, reader is obviously a fan of Harlan Coben's work. Um, so he might give some more of his books a try if you're into this one. And then someone else said it's an enjoyable book with a good mystery. So it's a good mystery. So if you like mystery, you might want to give this one a try. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and read the synopsis on the back before we jump into the first chapter. All right, after witnessing his father's death and sending his mom to rehab, Mickey Bolletier has to live with his estranged Uncle Myron and switch to a new school. The one saving grace is Ashley, Mickey's new girlfriend. But then Ashley vanishes without a trace. Unwilling to let another person walk out of his life, Mickey follows Ashley's trail to a seedy underworld that reveals that Ashley wasn't really who he thought at all. And neither, it turns out, was Mickey's father. Soon, Mickey finds himself caught up in a conspiracy so shocking that it makes everything else in his life look like child's play. And some other authors, um, Ridley Pearson said, it's a spellbinding novel of mystery and intrigue, adolescence and adulthood, crime and punishment from a writer who's at the very top of his game. I have one word for you. Wow. R.L. Stein actually said, Coben piles mystery on top of mystery until the suspense is almost unbearable. So many twists and shocks, I wanted to scream, but I had to keep reading instead. So that, those are some pretty good things that these other well-known authors are saying. <clears throat> All right. And uh, there is a sequel to this, and it's called Seconds Away. Um, it's right there on the back. Okay, so let's jump right in. Let's read this first chapter. I was walking to school, lost in feeling sorry for myself. My dad was dead, my mom in rehab, my girlfriend missing, when I saw the bat lady for the first time. So right away in the first line, I always try to see if the first line catches my attention, and this so far does. It, hit, it hits on everything really that's going to have to do, or everything the story is about pretty much. You know, his dad's passed away, his mom's in rehab, and his girlfriend goes missing. But who's the bat lady? That wasn't mentioned, was it? So yeah. So who's she? I had heard the rumors, of course. The Bat Lady supposedly lived alone in the dilapidated house on the corner of Hobart Gap Road and Pine. You know the one. I stood in front of it now. The worn yellow paint was shedding like an old dog. The once solid concrete walk was cracked into quarter-sized fragments. The uncut lawn had dandelions tall enough for the adult rides at Six Flags. Great imagery so far. The Bat Lady was said to be a hundred years old and only came out at night, and if some poor child hadn't made it home from a play date or practice at the Little League field before a nightfall, if he or she risked walking home in the dark instead of getting a ride, or was maybe crazy enough to cut through her yard, the Bat Lady got you. What she supposedly did with you was never made clear. No child had vanished from this town in years. Teenagers, like my girlfriend Ashley, sure, they could be here one day, holding your hand, looking deep into your eyes, making your heart go boom, 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 and be gone the next. But little kids? No, they were safe, even from the Bat Lady. 
So I was just about to cross to the other side of the street, even I, a mature teenager entering my sophomore year as a brand new high school, at a brand new high school, wanted to avoid that spooky house when the door creaked open. I froze. For a moment, nothing happened. The door was all the way open now, but no one was there. I stopped and waited. Maybe I blinked, I can't be sure. But when I looked again, the bat lady was there. She could have been a hundred years old, or maybe two hundred. I had no idea why they called her bat lady. She didn't look like a bat. Her hair was gray and hippie long, hanging down to her waist. It blew in the wind, obscuring her face. She wore a torn white gown that resembled a bridal costume in an old horror movie or heavy metal video. Her spine was bent like a question mark. Slowly, Bat Lady raised a hand so pale it was more vein blue than white and pointed a shaky, bony finger in my direction. I said nothing. She kept pointing until she was sure I was looking. When she saw that I was, Bat Lady's wrinkled face spread into a smile that sent little icicles down my spine. Mickey? I had no idea how she knew my name. Your father isn't dead, Bat Lady said. Her words sent a jolt that knocked me back a step. He is very much alive. But standing there, watching her vanish back into her decrepit cave, I knew what she was telling me wasn't true, because I had seen my father die. Okay, that was weird. I stood in front of Bat Lady's house and waited for her to come back out. Now go. I walked over to the door and looked for a doorbell. There was none, so I started pounding on the door. It shook under the onslaught. The wood was so rough it scraped my knuckles like sandpaper. Paint chips fell off as fell off as if the door had a bad case of dandruff. That's a good that's good imagery. But the bat lady did not appear. So now what? Kick down the door and then what? Find an old lady in a weird white dress and demand she explain her wackadoodle rants? Maybe she had gone upstairs. Maybe Bat Lady was now getting ready for her loony day, changing out of her white dress, heading to the shower. Ugh, time to go. I didn't want to miss the first bell anyway. My homeroom teacher, Mr. Hill, was a stickler for punctuality. Plus, I still hoped that Ashley would show up today. She had vanished into thin air. Maybe she would just reappear the same way. I met Ashley three weeks ago at high school orientation for both new kids, Ashley and me, for example, and incoming freshmen, all of whom already knew one another because they went to this middle school and elementary school together. No one ever seems to leave this town. An orientation should consist of visiting your classes, getting a tour of the facilities, maybe even a few classmates, but no, that's not enough. We had to participate in these moronic, dehumanizing, and totally awkward team building exercises. The first involvement, the trust fall, Mr. Miss Owens, a PE teacher with a smile that looked like it had been painted on by a drunk clown, started off by trying to fire us up. Good morning, everyone, a few groans. Then, and I hate when adults do this, she shouted, I know you're more excited than that, so let's try it again. Good morning, everyone. The students yelled, good morning, louder this time, not because they were excited, but because they wanted her to stop. <laughs> We were broken down into groups of six. Mine featured three incoming freshmen and three upperclassmen who had just moved to town. One of you will stand on this pedestal and wear a blindfold, Miss Owens exclaimed. Everything she said ended in an exclamation mark. You will cross your arms and now I want you to pretend that the pedestal is on fire. Oh no! Miss Owens put her hands on her cheeks like the kid in the home alone. It's so hot that you'll have to fall back. Someone raised his hand. Why would we keep our arms crossed if the pedestal was on fire? Murmurs of agreement. Miss Owens' painted on smile didn't change, but I thought I noticed a twitch in her right eye. Your arms are tied. They are? No, they're not. Pretend. But if we pretend that, why do we need the blindfold? Can't we just pretend not to see or close our eyes? Someone else said. Miss Owens fought for control. The pedestal is so hot from the fire that you fall backward off of it. Backward? Wouldn't we jump, Miss Owens? Really, why would we fall backward? I mean, it's not that hot. I mean, if it's that hot, Miss Owens had enough. Because I say so. You will fall backward, the rest of the group will catch you, then you'll switch places until everyone has a turn falling backward. We all did this, though some of us were hesitant. I'm 6'4 and weigh 200 pounds. The group winced when they saw me. Another girl in my group, an incoming freshman dressed all in black, was on the fat side. 
I know I should call her something other than fat, something more politically correct, but I'm not sure what without sounding condescending. Large? Chubby? Heavy? I say those without judgment, the same way I might say small, bony, or skinny. The big girl hesitated before she climbed onto the pedestal. Someone in our group laughed, then someone else. Other than to show this girl that cruelty will not stop when you enter high school, I had no idea how this exercise was supposed to help anyone. When the girl didn't fall back right away, one of the freshman boys snickered and said, Come on, Emma, we'll catch you. It was not a voice that gave her confidence. She pulled down her blindfold and looked back at us. I met her eye and nodded. Finally, she let herself fall. We caught her, adding some dramatic grunts, but Emma didn't look any more trusting. When we played some, then we played some dumb paintball game where two people got hurt and then we moved into an exercise called, I wish I were kidding, poisoned peanut butter. For this event, you had to cross over a 10 yard patch of poisoned peanut butter, but as Ms. Owens, as Ms. Owens explained, only two of you can wear the anti-poison shoes to get across that on, on time. Wait a minute, no, sorry. Only two of you can wear the anti-poison shoes to get across at a time. In short, you had to carry other team members on your back. The small girls laughed with the tee hee as they were carried. A photographer with the Star Ledger newspaper was there, snapping away. The reporter asked him glowing Miss Owens questions, her answers filled with words like bonding, welcoming, trusting. I couldn't imagine what sort of story you do on something like this, but maybe they were desperate for human interest material. I stood back in the back of the poisoned peanut butter line with Emma. Black mascara was running down her face with what might have been silent tears. I wondered if the photographer would get that. As it came closer to Emma's turn for teammates to carry her across the poisoned peanut butter, I could actually feel her start to shake in fear. Think about it. It's your first day at a new school, you're a girl who weighs probably 200 pounds, and you're forced to put on gym shorts, and then to complete some inane group task, your new smaller classmates have to lug you like a bear, a beer cake, sorry, like a beer cake for 10 yards while you just want to curl up in a ball and die. Who thinks this is a good idea? Miss Owens came over to our team. Ready, Emma? Emma with a long E or Emma. Oh, Emma? Okay. I didn't know what her name was now. Emma, Emma said nothing. You go, girl, right across the poison peanut butter. You can do it. Then I said, Miss Owens? She turned her gaze on me. The smile never changed, but the eyes narrowed slightly. And you are? My name is Mickey Boletere. I'm an incoming sophomore, and I'm gonna sit out this exercise if it's okay. Again, the flutter in Miss Owens' right eye. Excuse me? Yeah, I don't really think I'm up for being carried. The other kids looked at me like I had a third arm growing out of my forehead. Mr. Boletere, you're new here. The exclamation point was gone from Miss Owens' voice. I would think you'd want to participate. Is it mandatory? I asked. Excuse me? Is participating in this particular exercise mandatory? Well, no, it's not manda- Then I'm sitting out. I looked over at Emma. Emma. Would you mind keeping me company? We walked away then. Behind me, I could hear the world go silent. And then Miss Owens blew a whistle, stopping the exercise and calling for lunch. When we were a few more feet away, Emma said, Wow. What? She looked at me straight in the eye. You saved that fat girl. I bet you're really proud of yourself. Then she shook her head and walked away. I looked behind me. Miss Owens watched us. She still had that smile, but the glare in her eyes made it clear that I'd managed to make an enemy my first day. The, bun the sun beat down upon me. I let it. I closed my eyes for a moment. I thought about my mother, who was coming home from rehab soon. I thought about my father, who was dead and buried. I felt very much alone. The school cafeteria was closed. School opening was still weeks away, so we all had to bring our own. I bought a buffalo chicken sub at Wilkes Deli and sat by myself on a grassy hill overlooking the football field. I was about to bite into it when I noticed her. She wasn't my type, though I really don't have a type. I've spent my entire life traveling overseas. My parents worked for a charitable foundation in places like Laos and Peru and Sierra Leone. I don't have any siblings. <clears throat> it was exciting and fun when I was a kid, but it got tiresome and difficult as I grew older. I wanted to stay in one place. I wanted to make some friends and play on one basketball team and, well, meet girls and do teenage stuff. It's hard to do that when you're backpacking in Nepal. 
This girl was very pretty, sure, but she was also prim and proper and preppy. Something about her looked stuck up, though I couldn't say what. Her hair was the pale blonde of a porcelain doll. She wore an actual, well, skirt, not one of those short, short ones and that you might have been bobby socks and what might have been bobby socks and looked as though she just walked out of my grandparents Brooks Brothers catalog. I took a bite of my sandwich and then I noticed that she didn't have a lunch. Maybe she was on some kind of weird diet, but for some reason I didn't think so. I don't know why, but I decided to walk over to her. I wasn't much in the mood to talk or to meet anyone. I was still reeling from all the new people in my life and really didn't want to add anymore. Maybe it was just because she was so pretty. Maybe I'm just as shallow as the next guy. Or maybe it was because the lonely can sometimes sense the lonely. Maybe what drew me to her was the fact that, like me, she seemed to want to keep to herself. I approached tentatively. When I got close enough, I gave a half wave and said, Hi. I always open with super smooth lines like that. She looked up at me and shaded eyes of and shaded eyes the green of emeralds. Hi. Yep, very pretty. I stood there feeling awkward. My face reddened. My hands suddenly felt too big for my body. The second thing I told her was, my name's Mickey. Man, am I smooth or what? Every line's a killer. I'm Ashley Kent. Cool, I said. Yeah. Somewhere in this world, in China or India or a remote section of Africa, there was probably a bigger dork than me, but I couldn't swear to that. I pointed at her empty lap. Did you bring lunch? No, I forgot. This sandwich is huge. Do you want half? Oh, I couldn't, but I insisted, and then she invited me to join her. Ashley was also a sophomore and also new in town. Her father, she said, was a renowned surgeon. Her mother was a lawyer. If life were a movie, this was the part where you'd start the music montage. Some sappy song would be playing while they flashed to Ashley and me sharing lunch, talking, laughing, looking coy, holding hands, and ending with that first chaste kiss. But that was three weeks ago. I made it into Mr. Hill's class <clears throat> just as the bell sounded. He took roll call, the bell pealed again, and it was time for the first period. Ashley's homeroom was across the, the hall. I waited and saw that yet again she wasn't here. I described Ashley before as my girlfriend. It might have been an exaggeration. We were taking it slow, I guess. We'd kissed twice, no more. I didn't really like anyone else at my new school. I liked her. It wasn't love, but it was also early. On the other hand, feelings like this usually diminish. That's the truth. We like to pretend that we, as we, that they grow as we get closer to our new partner, but most times it's the opposite. We guys see the gorgeous girl and we get this big time crush, one that makes it hard to breathe and makes us so anxious, one that's so bad that we always blow it. If we do somehow land her, the feelings begin to diminish almost immediately. In this case, my feelings for Ashley really didn't, really did grow. That was a little scary in a good way. Then one day I came to school and Ashley was absent. I tried her cell phone, but there was no answer. She was gone the next day too, then the next. I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't have her home address. I checked the name Kent online, but they must have been unlisted. In fact, there was nothing about her online at all. Ashley had simply vanished into thin air. And that's the first chapter of Shelter. Okay, so one of the reviews were correct that there are there is some humor in there, which I loved. Um, I just thought, you know, his attitude is cracking me up, really. So, you know, I, I think I can hear this uh, the speaker's voice in my head, you know, when he's talking. Um, so I hope that I portrayed, you know, how he talks well. But so, so I like that there's some humor in there. It really grabs your attention if there's humor. It, it brings you into the story, regardless of the suspenseful parts. If there's humor, it makes it enjoyable to read as you read it. So, so far, I really like our main character, Mickey. Um, he's really likable so far with the humor and how he saved that heavy set girl um, from having to be carried, you know, like she, the teacher was making everybody do this and he said, is it mandatory? And, you know, because otherwise you shouldn't be forced to do something that you don't feel comfortable doing, If you know? So um, we have a little bit of some real world situations here. We have a girl who's heavier set, a new girl, has to deal, go through this, um, having to be carried, people laughing at her. Um, so we have that. We have, you know, the teacher who's overexcited, wanting everybody to participate in this thing, and not everybody wants to. And, 
you know, so, and a lot of teachers have that where they want, they're so excited about something, and they want everyone to participate, but not everyone's going to be, you know, comfortable with it, so, you know, it's good for teachers to understand that. So, so that's a good um, real world thing that's in here to learn from. Um, and then, of course, relationships, the case of a relationship in high school, you know, your high school sweetheart. And in this case, you know, it was almost, almost not really love at first sight. He's, he's as Mickey kind of said, you know, I don't think it's love, but uh, she's really pretty. You know, I really like her. She's really pretty. Um, so, and she's got emerald green eyes. So, again, the imagery in this is really good. I like how, you know, people are described. Um, it said she had pale blonde hair, emerald green eyes. Um, and then there were some other descriptions right at the beginning, actually, and I'll go back and uh, reference that. It was like right at the first, yeah, the worn yellow paint shedding like an old dog. Um, and then about the thing, the shedding of the door, it looked like it had dandruff, you know, that was pretty funny. So some interesting word choices to use for the descriptions in the book. And so I like that this author, I like the way that she's describing things. So. I hope that this first chapter of this story really uh, grabbed your attention. If you want to read this book, we have it here at the library available to check out. Just give us a call um, and we'll put it on hold for you if you want. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that and I will have another one next time we do our first chapter Friday. Everybody have a great weekend and see you next time.